Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. A new proposed highway threatens tiger territory in Arunachal Pradesh. See, Arunachal Pradesh has three tiger reserves. This includes the Namdapa National Park and Tiger Reserve, the Pake or Pakhui Wildlife Sanctuary and Tiger Reserve, and as well as the Kamlang Tiger Reserve. The state government has already taken up the construction of a two-lane highway that passes through the Namdapa Tiger Reserve. And this project had been earlier opposed by environmental activists because of its impact on wildlife. Now, a new highway project has been proposed by the state government, which cuts through the Pake Tiger Reserve in Arunachal Pradesh. This new highway project has been named as the East-West Industrial Corridor and it proposes to connect the West Kaming district in Arunachal Pradesh with Assam. A part of this highway project includes an elevated stretch that passes through the Pake Tiger Reserve. And this proposed project is being opposed by environmental activists. Because according to them, this project would have an impact on the habitat and as well as on the wildlife. They argue that the highway project not only threatens the Pake Tiger Reserve, but it also poses a threat to the neighboring Nameri Tiger Reserve in Assam, which is located adjacent to the Pake Tiger Reserve. See, off late, the construction of highways and elevated corridors through national parks and tiger reserves has been frequently in news. One such highway has been proposed to connect the Bandipur Tiger Reserve in Karnataka with the Vainad Wildlife Sanctuary in Kerala. This proposed project is being supported by the government of Kerala and as well as by the people of Vainad district. Whereas this project is being opposed by environmental activists and by the people of Karnataka and neighboring Tamil Nadu as well. Those who are opposed to such projects, they argue that when highways are built at ground level through the core regions of protected areas, it automatically results in an increase in traffic and this translates to more accidents involving wildlife. So as a solution to this, the proponents of such projects have proposed the construction of elevated corridors through the core regions of protected areas where dedicated underpasses can be provided for animal movement which can prevent the occurrence of such accidents. One such elevated corridor has already been built in the Kana Pench Corridor which connects the Kana Tiger Reserve with the Pench Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. This project as well had witnessed the same controversy. The proponents of such projects have always argued that such projects are essential to improve connectivity in the region and promote economic activities. They argue that such projects have a minimal impact on the environment and wildlife because elevated corridors can provide for dedicated underpasses for animal movement which can help in preventing accidents and enable their movement from one habitat to another. But those who are opposed to such projects, they argue that these are linear infrastructure projects which end up dividing the habitat or fragmenting the habitat. As we have discussed in previous sessions, habitat fragmentation is one of the major causes for loss of biodiversity. We have discussed that linear projects such as the construction of roads, kennels, the laying of power lines, telephone cables, etc. They end up dividing the habitat and it does have an impact on the wildlife. Environmental activists argue that when highways and elevated corridors are built through the core regions of protected areas, it definitely contributes to air pollution and noise pollution and there is no guarantee that underpasses can bring down the occurrence of accidents. Now let us quickly talk about the Namdapa Tiger Reserve, the Pake Tiger Reserve and the Nameri Tiger Reserve from a prelims perspective. The Namdapa Tiger Reserve is located over here in Arunachal Pradesh and it is considered to be India's easternmost tiger reserve. It is a part of the eastern Himalayas which in itself is a biodiversity hotspot and it is located between the Mishmi Hills and the Patkai Range of the Northeast. This particular point can be very important for map-based questions in prelims. Then the type of vegetation we find in the Namdapa National Park is tropical evergreen and temperate broadleaf forests and some of the important fauna include the Namdapa flying squirrel 
which has been listed as critically endangered, red panda listed as endangered, and snow leopard and the clouded leopard, both of which have been listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. Next, we have the Pake Tiger Reserve that is located over here in Arunachal Pradesh. It is located in the foothills of eastern Himalayas and it is bound by the Kameng River, which is one of the major tributaries of the Brahmaputra. The vegetation you find here is evergreen forests, semi-evergreen forests and Himalayan broadleaf forests. And the important species includes tigers, elephants and the clouded leopard. Next, we have the Nameri Tiger Reserve that is located over here. It is located in Assam and it is adjacent to the Pake Tiger Reserve in Arunachal Pradesh. So basically, the Nameri Tiger Reserve and the Pake Tiger Reserve are contiguous to each other. The Nameri Tiger Reserve is also located in the foothills of eastern Himalayas. So you find the same vegetation in the Nameri Tiger Reserve as well. And amongst the important species, we have tigers, elephants, the clouded leopard, and we also have the golden masir, which is a type of fish that has been listed as endangered by the IUCN. In fact, the Nameri Tiger Reserve is a very important habitat for the golden masir fish. And due to its endangered status, fishing of this species has been prohibited in the Nameri Tiger Reserve from 2011. Now let's take up the next article. Rushikulia Rukri, all set to welcome Olive Ridleys. So first let us talk about Olive Ridley turtles. See, Olive Ridley turtles are quite unique and they are found in the tropical and warm waters around the world. It has been listed as vulnerable by the IUCN and these turtles are primarily found in the Pacific Ocean and as well as in the Indian Ocean. But they can also be found in few parts of the Atlantic Ocean as well. The most unique feature about Olive Ridley turtles is their mass nesting and mass hatching phenomena. Every year, Olive Ridley turtles choose preferred nesting sites around the world that are located in the tropical areas and they lay eggs in large numbers. During this nesting season at preferred locations, thousands and thousands of mother turtles walk up to the beach and they lay the eggs in near unison and they walk back into the waters. After a few weeks of mass nesting, we get to witness the mass hatching of these eggs. Thousands of baby turtles hatch at once and they start walking towards the sea. This is considered to be a visual spectacle and a critical natural event for the environment. But the Olive Ridley turtles are facing a number of threats. Their mass nesting and mass hatching phenomena is being affected by mechanized fishing which makes use of trawling boats. Mechanized boats and trawlers scoop up large quantities of fish from the bottom of the seabed and they accidentally pick up Olive Ridley turtles as well. They are also affected by marine pollution caused by ships, oil leakage, plastic pollution etc. Then the erosion of beach due to rising sea levels and the accumulation of debris and plastic waste on the beach is also a threat to the mass nesting and mass hatching phenomena. Apart from this, the mother turtles and the baby turtles, they face the threat of being hunted by predators or being poached by human beings. In the case of India, the coastline of Odessa is a preferred nesting site for the olive ridleys. Along the entire coastline of Odessa, we have a number of sporadic nesting beaches, but mass nesting sites are located at the Rushikulya Rukri at the mouth of the Rushikulya River and as well as at the Gahir Mata beach. So this article refers to the arrangements that the state forest department is making for the upcoming mass nesting season. The main objective of the forest authorities is to provide security to the mother turtles and the eggs. So a metal fence is being erected around the mass nesting site in order to protect the mother turtles and the eggs from humans and as well as from predators. The forest department and environmental activists are conducting a community awareness program for the local fishing community in order to ensure that the local communities become a part of the conservation efforts. Then to protect the mother turtles that are waiting near the coastline from mechanized boats and trawlers, mechanized fishing and trawling has been banned 
and the state authorities are even patrolling the region in order to enforce this ban. Then over the last few months, the State Forest Department has been working with volunteers and environmental activists in order to clean up the beaches so that all the accumulated debris and plastic waste can be removed. And to tackle hunting and poaching, the state authorities have taken steps to prevent the entry of predators and they have set up constant monitoring at the mass nesting site. Now let's take up the next article. The World Health Organization, UNICEF and Lancet have brought out a report which evaluates the performance of governments with regard to protection of their children's health, environment and their future. According to this report, no country in the world provides adequate protection to children for ensuring their survival and well-being. The report also identifies a few immediate threats that could affect a child's health, environment and its future. It identifies climate change and ecological degradation as an immediate and as well as a long-term threat. Because degradation of environment and climate change can cause shortage of water, shortage of food, it can increase pollution and extreme weather events, and the maximum impact of all these events is always felt on the weaker sections, which includes children as well. So as a result, the health, the future, and the very survival of children could be affected. The report evaluates the performance of around 180 countries and it ranks Norway, Republic of Korea, that is South Korea, and Netherlands at the top of the list. The report says that children have the best chance of survival in these three countries. The report places India at the 131st position out of 180 countries and it appreciates India for making improvements with regard to providing health and sanitation facilities for children. The credit for this should largely go to the success of the Swachh Bharat mission. And the report also points out that India's low spending on health care could be a major risk for the health and future of children. The report also brings out the dichotomy of obesity and malnutrition that is being seen in countries around the world. For example, if you look at India's rural areas and if you look at the weaker sections in urban areas, you will find that children born in these families report very high levels of malnutrition. But at the same time, children born to middle class and upper class families, especially in urban areas, they report very high levels of obesity. In fact, the same trend was brought out recently by a report of the Indian government as well. But this trend is not just limited to India, but it has become a global trend. The report says that the number of obese children in the world has increased by 11 times between 1975 and 2016. This also highlights the deep socio-economic divide that exists in our societies. While rapid economic growth has brought a lot of affluence to a number of families around the world. We still have millions of families in rural areas and in few pockets of the urban areas who have been deprived of similar development and growth opportunities. So this socio-economic divide is directly responsible for the dichotomy of obesity and malnutrition that is witnessed in a particular country. The report also praises a few countries for making efforts to reduce their CO2 emissions. According to the report, only 9 countries in the world are on track to achieve their CO2 emission targets. And this includes Sri Lanka from the South Asian region. Now let us take up a column from page number 10, which refers to India's demographic dividend. See, the United Nations Population Fund defines demographic dividend as the economic growth potential that results from a population's age structure. That is, in a given population, if the number of people in the working age is higher, then the economic growth potential for that country would also be higher. So when people are in the working age group, that is between 15 to 64 years, then they can be productive and they can contribute to the growth of a country's economy. A demographic dividend is said to occur when a country's working age population is higher than its non-working age population. 
in the case of india we are currently going through a demographic dividend phase currently india is said to have one of the youngest population in the world and by 2022 its median age would be just 28 years in comparison the median age for china and the united states would be 37 years for western europe it would be 45 years and for japan it would be 49 years this clearly shows that while major countries in the world continue to age india will still retain a young population this phase of demographic dividend began for india in 2004 2005 and it is set to last for another 5 decades at least so if india aspires to become a developed country in the next 20 to 30 years then this would be the perfect opportunity and it needs to capitalize on this if you look at developed asian economies such as japan china and south korea they have achieved spectacular growth over the last 30 to 40 years mainly because they were able to exploit their demographic dividend see if you look at the success stories of japan china and south korea it becomes very clear that having a demographic dividend alone is not sufficient to generate economic growth because having a demographic dividend is more of luck and not destiny in itself these countries were able to transform their positive age structure into economic growth by coming up with suitable policies and programs through such policies these countries ensured that good health care and good education was provided to their citizens they created sufficient employment opportunities and they also built the right kind of infrastructure and this is what helped these countries to transform their demographic dividend into economic growth so if india's policies and programs are not in line with these objectives then our demographic dividend can quickly turn into a demographic disaster see if you look at india's state wise population you will find that it is quite heterogeneous for example if you look at kerala's population it is already aging whereas bihar's population is still very young and it will continue to remain in the working age group until 2051 so this heterogeneous age structure is what helping india to sustain its demographic dividend for more than 5 decades but due to this heterogeneity by 2031 the working age population in at least 11 out of 22 major states would have declined so this is something that india needs to watch out for and plan accordingly india's policies and programs should be based on the heterogeneous mix of india's population then having a higher percentage of working age population doesn't necessarily translate into economic growth because your working age population should be employable in the first place see employability of a person is dependent on his health on his education his skill set etc the economic survey and a recent report by the unicef points out that india's youth are unemployable even though they are educated because they do not have the right kind of skill sets so this raises questions on the quality of education that is being provided in india and the quality of vocational training and skill development programs then with regard to health as well there are various reports which point out the high prevalence of malnutrition in india and malnutrition can directly affect the productivity of working age population then another challenge for india would be its vast gender divide the lack of inclusion of women in education and in the workforce could come as a major setback for india because nearly half of india's population are women so when such a large percentage of your population are not being utilized due to gaps in education gaps in healthcare and nutrition and due to the gender gap then you cannot expect to transform your demographic dividend into economic growth the author says that if india hopes to leverage its demographic dividend then the government needs to come out with suitable policies and programs or else india's demographic dividend can quickly turn into a demographic disaster in the next column the writer makes a case for upholding the rights of the dalits see recently 
the Supreme Court declared that claiming reservation for promotions in government jobs is not a fundamental right. This landmark judgment of the Supreme Court prevents Dalits from claiming reservation for promotions in government jobs. So going forward, Dalits can claim reservation in education and while seeking entry to government jobs, but they cannot claim reservation as a fundamental right while seeking promotions in government jobs. The writer says that this decision of the Supreme Court will lead to further oppression of the Dalits and it will result in the exclusion of scheduled castes in the higher bureaucracy. The writer presents data to show that Dalits are underrepresented in the higher bureaucracy even though they have been given reservation while entering government services. The writer even points out the prevalence of untouchability in the Indian society even though it has been abolished by the constitution and he says that the dominance of the upper caste and the prevalence of untouchability will further result in the discrimination and dehumanization of the Dalits. So by making these arguments, the writer says that the Supreme Court needs to uphold the rights of the Dalits by taking note of their prevailing situation. Now let's take up the next article. The Prime Minister has called upon young students to cherish India's biodiversity while delivering his monthly Man Ki Baat address. During this radio address, the Prime Minister highlighted India's biodiversity by talking about the Meghalayan cave fish which was recently discovered by a team of experts from India, United States and other countries. This cave dwelling fish was discovered last week in the caves of the Jaintia Hills in Meghalaya and it has been labelled as the world's largest subterranean fish. Experts believe that this fish is closely related to the Mahseer fish that we spoke about earlier but it is also different from the endangered Mahseer fish because the Meghalayan cave fish displays troglomorphism. Troglomorphism is a type of adaptation that is displayed by animals that are living in constant darkness. Since the Meghalayan cave fish lives in the dark caves of Jaintia Hills, it is blind because it does not have eyes and it is white in color because it lacks melanin content. So this is a unique adaptation that is displayed by animals that live in constant darkness and it is referred to as troglomorphism. The Prime Minister has also referred to ISRO's UVICA program. Under this program, ISRO arranges site visits for students to various centers and facilities of ISRO and it also conducts workshops on astronomy. This program is run by ISRO mainly to encourage young students to gain interest in science and technology, especially in space technology. During the radio address, the Prime Minister has also praised the Indian Air Force for running an aircraft on biofuel. Recently, the Indian Air Force flew the AN-32 aircraft from the Leh Airport and this became the first aircraft in India to be run on biofuel. The aircraft used a mixture of 10% Indian biojet fuel which has been developed by CSIR and the Indian Institute of Petroleum which is located in Dehradun. So these topics related to environment and ecology and science and technology can be very important for your upcoming prelims because these topics have been highlighted by the Prime Minister himself. Now let us take up the practice questions. Which of the following statements are correct? The Narcotics Control Bureau is both a law enforcement agency and an intelligence agency. It was constituted by the Government of India in 1986 under the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act of 1985. The Act draws inspiration from Article 47 of the Indian Constitution and fulfills India's obligations to the UN Convention against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances. All the three statements are correct so, option D is the right answer. See, Article 47 of the Indian Constitution mandates the Indian government to prohibit harmful addictive substances such as drugs, alcohol, etc. which can harm the health of the Indian citizens. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 4 
that is related to the Narcotics Control Bureau. This article refers to the arrest of three foreign nationals by the NCB for possessing heroin worth 60 crore rupees. Now let us take up the second practice question. Who was referred to as Kerala Gandhi? The correct answer is option A, Koyapalli Kelappan Nair or K. Kelappan. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 11 which refers to the contribution of Payanur Taluk in the Kannur district of Kerala to India's freedom struggle and to the Dalit rights movement in India. The article says that Payanur Taluk in Kannur district was at the forefront of the Simon Go Back movement and when Mahatma Gandhi launched Dandi March in 1930, it was K. Kelapan who led the Salt Satyagraha in Payanur. Payanur was also at the forefront of India's anti-untouchability movement and K. Kalappan was recognized for his contribution to the anti-untouchability movement and due to his belief in Gandhian principles, he is referred to as Kerala's Gandhi. Now let us take up the third practice question. The P-8 Poseidon aircraft that India has acquired from United States is primarily used for anti-submarine warfare. Option B is the correct answer. The P-8 Poseidon has been inducted into the Indian Navy. This version of the aircraft is referred to as P-8I and it has been developed and manufactured by Boeing. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 13 which refers to the defense deals that might be discussed during Donald Trump's visit to India. India is looking to acquire high-altitude, long-endurance drones such as the Sea Guardian drones which can be used not only for surveillance and intelligence collection, but it can also be used to launch missile attacks. Then we have already discussed in previous sessions that India has already finalized a deal to procure the MH-60R Seahawk helicopters and more Apache attack helicopters for the Indian Armed Forces. India is also exploring the possibility of acquiring more P-8I Poseidon aircrafts for anti-submarine warfare. Now let us take up a map-based question. Which of the following tiger reserves are found in Karnataka? Nagarhole, Badra, Anshi Dandeli, BRT Tiger Reserve and Bandipur. All the five tiger reserves are found in Karnataka. So the correct answer is option D. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 8. According to this article, the MM Hills Wildlife Sanctuary found in the Chamrajnagar district of Karnataka could be soon upgraded to a tiger reserve and the approval from NTCA is expected any time soon. So if MM Hills is declared as a tiger reserve, then Karnataka will also have six tiger reserves and it will place Karnataka on par with Madhya Pradesh which also has six tiger reserves. And also note that if MM Hills Wildlife Sanctuary is declared as a tiger reserve, then the Chamrajnagar district alone will have three tiger reserves within its limits. This will include MM Hills, Bandipur and BRT. Now let's take up another map based question. Which of the following statements are correct? Hudson Bay is the largest bay in the world when measured by the length of its shoreline. Bay of Bengal is the largest bay in the world in terms of area. Both the statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. Please look at this map. This is where the Hudson Bay is located. It is located in the northeastern part of Canada and it is the largest bay in the world when measured by the length of its shoreline. But Bay of Bengal is the largest bay in the world in terms of area. Now let us take up a practice question from the 2015 prelims paper. Which one of the following is associated with the issue of control and phasing out of the use of ozone depleting substances? This is a pretty simple and straightforward question. The correct answer is option B, the Montreal Protocol. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, evaluate India's performance with regard to protecting its children's health, their environment and their future according to a recently released report by the World Health Organization, UNICEF and Lancet. The second question, India's population is among the youngest in an aging world. Illustrate how India can leverage its demographic dividend. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.